let's talk a little bit about vaginal snake oil and my best friend, Gwyneth Paltrow. So, <laughs> so I have nothing to declare, which is, I think, a really important part of what I'm doing. Uh, when people present medical information online and they talk about products, they're almost always selling something. And bias, as we know, really affects the quality of the information. Even getting one free soda from a drug rep can affect, actually, how you think about about a medication that you might be presenting to a patient. So it's really important to have that. So I want to tell you a little bit about my backstory. A lot of you, who, anyone who follows me online, might know some of it. I'm in the sepsis piece kind of uh, rolls into that as well. So I got interested in medical information. Oh, before we get to that, I just want to talk about this because I feel like I'm always going to be known as the person who talks about Gwyneth Paltrow's vagina. And so much so <laughs> that somebody sent me this image recently. It's some game that you put on your computer. I'm like not tech savvy at all. And I'm like one of the answers to the questions. <laughs> So at the end of this lecture, you will know the answer to this question if you don't. So anyway, I got interested in accurate online information. I mean, I'm a little bit ashamed. I should have been more interested because I'm just because I'm a doctor. But when I got pregnant, I was pregnant with triplets. And if any of you follow me online, you know that I have two sons. So subtraction kind of sucks for that type of math. And one of my sons died at birth, and my other two children were in the intensive care unit for months and months because they were born at 26 weeks. And in addition to being very premature, my son Oliver, you know, who's 783 grams, also had a cardiac defect that needed surgery but he couldn't have surgery because he was too small. And you think the worst thing in the world you're gonna hear is that your tiny premature baby needs heart surgery and then someone tells you that he can't have it. Um, and so I started researching his heart condition and his lung conditions and both my children developed pulmonary disease of prematurity and there's a picture of them still on their oxygen. You could you used to be able to see me all over Denver, Colorado with two kids and oxygen tanks and all this kind of stuff. And I, like any other parent, was desperate to try to help them and try to find good information. And and one night, late at night, I found myself on a stem cell website page. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, that just sounds so good. That sounds like it could be the answer. And I almost clicked. I almost took my kid to China for a stem cell injection because I was so desperate. So I get what it's like to be Googling it. Who here in the audience has Googled a health condition at 3 in the morning? Right? Like everybody. So I get that desperation. And so I figured if somebody like me, who's always been obsessed with evidence-based medicine, could fall down that rabbit hole, obviously everybody could fall down that rabbit hole. And so I decided when my kids were a little bit older and they were a little bit healthier, that I would do my best and I would extend my privilege and try to clean up my little corner of the internet. And then Gwyneth Paltrow came along. <laughs> So where do people get their online information? And it's really important for us to know where people look. And what happens is people get all their information from places I would never go to. I would never get my health information from WebMD. It's shit. I can swear. Is that okay? Can I swear here? Okay. I would never go to Wikipedia. I would never go to a health magazine. But all of these places are where people go. And in fact, you know, if you go to WebMD, they're going to tell you to eat your placenta. <laughs> So, you know, a lot of these sites are invested in page clicks. A lot of these sites are invested in selling product. A lot of them are invested in their ad revenue. They're not invested in keeping you healthy. But as a physician, I know how to search online and weed out this kind of stuff, but we don't teach people that kind of sort of level of scientific literacy from a health standpoint for researching information. So the problem is when you go to these sites, you get a varying degree of content. And this was a study published a couple of years ago in one of the obstetrical gynecology journals, and they looked at information about IUDs. And the problem is we, you talk about all the misinformation that's there online, and then you add in women's health, and you get a whole different level, right? Because you have people who have ideas about contraception, and people who have ideas about abortion, and they want to get that information in as well. We also have this sort of cultural vaginal shame where people can't talk about their reproductive tract. You know, when you're at a dinner party and your back hurts, you can say, oh, my back's really sore. Oh, yeah, I did this. Oh, you should do this. What are you going to say? Oh, my vagina's a mess. Like, that's a conversation stopper. You know, unless you're with me, and then I'll be like, oh, my God, tell me about it. You know? So, 
So we know that just looking at IUDs, information is something that we know a lot about. This is incredibly well researched. We see that a lot of information is inaccurate. 100% of sites should say they're long acting. That's their definition, their long acting reversible contraception. It's actually in the terminology. You know, only 82% said they're highly effective. They're the most effective. So the problem is, is that there's a lot of just misinformation. Some of it is there, I would say it's well intentioned misinformation people trying to do their best. Other times it's people with ulterior motives, and other times it's people who just don't really care, and they've got content up there. And sometimes it's unfortunately doctors who are not up to date. So there's all different ways that people can get misinformation, even from well-meaning sites. And then, of course, there's sites that maybe are not as well-meaning, like my buddy Dr. Oz, right? Every time I see him, I'm like, oh, it just makes me cringe. Um, you know, and so, so there's sites that even have more outrageous information. And the problem is, is that the first piece of information you see primes you to believe that. So if the first thing you hear about your placenta is how great it would be to eat it to treat depression, or the, the, the first thing that you read about you know, losing weight is a liver detox, it's really hard to get that out of your mind. And so that's why we need to have more good content, but we also need to teach the literacy so people know how to research, so they know how to get there. And so they have trusted experts. In addition, there's the bias of selling products. And in fact, when I talk to people about how to research health information online, one of the things I do is say is if the site sells product, you've got to close the browser. You cannot trust that site for information, especially about that product, but really about no product. So, you know, I mean, if you're selling a $135 coffee enema machine and you're advertising it um, as your trusted medical experts pick, you know, you're, you're, you've really made your ad into your content and your content, your ad, and it's really difficult to tell the difference. You know, if you're selling supplements, and you know, the goop always likes to say that we're only starting conversations. Okay, well, you don't understand language then either, because starting a conversation means something different to me. That means like, hey, hi, how are you doing? Not go put coffee up your ass, right? <laughs> I mean, if you get that kind of conversation, then you should walk away. And then we've heard about it already, the illusory truth effect, right? The more you hear misinformation, the more common it is. And people love to talk about misinformation about the genital tract. It's everywhere, right? You know, our politicians are trying to weaponize it. You know, we have this sort of historical, cultural belief in purity, and it's very, very difficult to undo that. You know, we're talking since the beginning of time. And so when people see these, you know, you know, the Daily Mail is not a respected source, obviously, but, you know, the Independent or the Toronto Star, which is the largest print newspaper in Canada, when you see print newspapers like this devoting headlines to false information about the HPV vaccine, people start to think that maybe there's something to it. Of course you would, you, you couldn't not. And so if we're in this sort of, you know, 24 seven news cycle with, uh, you know, pages and pages showing up on your Facebook page or your Twitter and, and everybody's talking about it, it's hard not to know. And so I think it's really important that we teach people how to actually consume their information. The other problem is the fractious minority, and this is much more for online, you know. It when we just had print, if somebody wrote a truly crackpot letter, it didn't get published, right? If there was an ad hominem attack in the letter, I'm gonna guess it probably wasn't published. But now, anything goes if you have, you know, if you allow comments on your, um, on your sort of your site. And we know that the sort of this fractious minority can change what you think about the content. So there was some research published and they, they had people read posts, a fake post on nanotechnology. And then they responded to a survey about it. And they also, some people were given, uh, epi, you know, horrible comments afterwards with swear words and ad hominem attacks, and other people didn't get that. And guess what? Reading ad hominem attacks changed what you thought about the information. So it's really important to start thinking about that, and that's actually for me why I now really disable comments on a lot of my posts, because I don't want somebody, you know, yeah, you think it's funny that they leave that comment, and obviously, you know, they haven't understood what's there, but that comment can actually derail somebody who comes for a good reason. So one ad hominem attack is enough to inflate perceived risk. And then there's conspiracy theories. And you know, 
I had no, that's my dog, Hazel. Um, <laughs> and if you're, if, you're, if you're paying attention, you can see that she's positive for THC. <laughs> Hazel was a naughty girl. No. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I knew about medical conspiracy theories, and we know that 37% of the population believes one. They believe that AIDS is a construct of big pharma. They believe, obviously, vaccines cause autism, that the mercury fillings are, I don't know what they're doing to you, but obviously they're like making you pick up Wi-Fi or something, or that fluoride is, is you know, damaging your brain. All of these things that are making us unhealthier as a population. And I, I never really understood how people kind of believed that, because if you don't believe in conspiracy theories, you're a bit like, well, I, like, there's the evidence. What? I mean, what's going on? So I was out for a run with Hazel, and I live in California, a state where marijuana is legal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm on a regular path where a lot of people run with their dogs. And I come home, and I drop the dog off, and I go to Target, and I come back, and she's basically melted into the couch. And she's drooling, and she's incontinent, and I'm like, oh my god, my dog has some kind of neurotoxin, which of course I was right. Um, and so off we go to the emergency vet, and they said, oh, we've seen that before, that's marijuana. I'm like, well, I don't have that in my house. And they said, well, dogs pick it up all the time, because they're indiscriminate eaters. If you have a dog, you know that. They will eat anything. And, you know, she probably stepped on some, you know, residue from a pipe or something that was on the running path, and it got stuck on her foot, and she probably licked it off. So I posted this on Facebook just because I wanted to alert people in my area that, hey, this happened to my dog. It could happen to your dog. I didn't say anything negative about doing marijuana. I just said, hey, if you're out there, make sure to throw your residue in the trash. Be careful what you're dropping. And if your dog starts to drool and has dilated pupils and incontinent, she might have marijuana toxicity. And then all the conspiracy theorists came. I couldn't believe it. There were about 3,000 comments from people saying that I'd faked this. I'm like, really? You, like, I'm a doctor. I have better things to do with my time than fake posts about my dog stepping in marijuana. Like, what is wrong with you? And so, you know, they, this was, you know, this is cannabis, anti-cannabis propaganda. I didn't say anything about anti-cannabis. I just said, clean up after yourself. Be a good citizen. Um, okay, well, please use the information highway before you comment. This woman is not a vet. Okay, sure, you got me there. Um, and then, you know, obviously there were people who said I must be the most irresponsible pet owner ever in the history of pet owners because no dog ever eats anything that's not what they're supposed to eat. I'm like, have you seen a dog? <laughs> so you start to think if this is what people are, are believing about something like this, it's, you know, it, I think it's really, um, really very difficult to undo. And I just, I left it up as a social experiment, and every now and then I go back, and there's still these crazier and crazier and crazier comments. And I just, it, you know, I, 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 I have to say it really opened my eyes about how, how cult-like this actually is. And I think that being a conspiracy theorist actually is an identity for a lot of people. Uh, and it's fascinating that that would be an identity that people would want to have. So this is kind of how I sort of, you know, <laughs> summarize where we are. You know, I'm like science, I'm like, oh! You know, and snake oil's like, oh, yeah. Um, anyway, so that really sums it up. And I, that's the only meme I've ever done. And my children are embarrassed that that's the meme I have. But that's life. Uh, anyway, so we have to, you know, the way that we fight this is from different fronts. So in addition, I've alluded to this a little bit earlier. but. Women especially are more vulnerable to this information or this misinformation. From a historical standpoint, women have really been excluded from medicine since the beginning of time. Early cadavers were only males that were dissected because it was considered inappropriate for early surgeons to actually see a naked woman. And so the early anatomy textbooks were basically women and midwives who told doctors what they thought about their body. And then, the, you know, the male doctors decided if they thought it was right or not. And they wrote it down, kind of like the original mansplaining. No, we don't think that's what happens. This is what we think. Not that we've ever seen it before or touched it, but, you know. Um, and uh, women didn't get exams because their purity mattered more than their health. Um, and basically, a woman's worth was distilled to her hymen and her uterus. And we have this, because of this, this culture of vaginal shame, where women are constantly getting messages about improving their troublesome vaginas and their vulvas. And this is something that people profit off of significantly, because we can't have these conversations in sort of non-sophomoric ways. 
And so we would have people selling douches and Lysol douches, right? You know, vaginal neglect was apparently a thing. She just had one flaw, her skanky vagina, right? <laughs> But if you start thinking about the illusory truth effect, and this is the messaging, this is the only public messaging about the vaginas, about how it needs to be cleaned, you can see how that would affect people. You could see how your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother have had these messages, and I'm not saying this in like an epigenic way, I'm thinking it as in like, they were encultured to believe this, and so that's what they're gonna teach their daughters. And then that, that teaching is gonna keep getting passed down. And so it's very difficult, and when you look at these early ads from the 20s and 30s and 40s, and you know, women died from this. It was pretty serious. Uh, it's not a lot different from what we see today. We see self-help books, you know, do-it-yourself gynecology, which it don't. Um, and uh, we see things like, you know, women being told to put yogurt in their vagina. All these things to sort of tame sort of a rogue genital tract that actually really has nothing wrong with it. But this sort of idea has been instilled uh, that there is. And so we get celebrities in on the uh, in on the, the action because obviously a 16-year-old vagina is the ideal. I mean, I don't even know how to unpack all of that. Um, you know, like what, how old is your husband? He's 50. I mean, that's just really troubling messaging to me. And so it's celebrities like to make money, I guess, outside of the movies. I thought making money in you know, Marvel movies and other kinds of things would be enough, but apparently it's not. And so when you look at a site like Goop and you have somebody like Gwyneth Paltrow or Dr. Oz or Dr. Axe, who wants you to use echinacea for chlamydia, don't, um, and they are not filling the gaps left by modern medicine. And I am the first to admit that there are many problems with modern medicine. They are capitalizing on those gaps. They are taking the troubling messages that women have been exposed to for generations since the beginning of time, and they're amplifying them. And I love this quote because I think Gwyneth Paltrow thinks she was really smart by saying this, but I can monetize those eyeballs, she told the students. Goop had learned to do a special kind of dark art, to corral the vitriol of the internet and the ever-present, shall we call it, cultural ambivalence about GP herself and turn them into cash. It's never clickbait, she told the class. It's cultural firestorm when it's about a woman's vagina. The room was silent, and then she cupped her hands around her mouth and yelled, vagina, 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 as if she was yodeling and she's here to help, right? And it's amazing to me how people can rebrand themselves in such a way, and nobody questions them, and it just perpetuates. So I want you to think about these words here, you know, pure, wholesome, natural, fresh, ancient, clean. These are words that you see a lot in a lot of messaging, and the women in the room will get exposed to that messaging a lot more than the men. And, you know, I could be talking about a toxin-free tampon, where the term toxin has been misused, a feminine wash. I could be talking about an abstinence-only program from the Susan B. Anthony list, who are the literal handmaidens of the patriarchy. Or, you know, the qualification for America's next virgin bride, which if we don't all get out and vote, maybe actually become a reality. So this troubling messaging it really overlaps between sort of the natural movement and what I can only describe as sort of this return of the purity movement, something that would sort of seek to keep women back as opposed to advance them and sort of weaponizing sort of this vaginal shame. And so that brings us to the jade egg, which is the ultimate weaponizing sort of a vaginal shame, this idea that you can somehow harness lunar energy and put it in your vagina and you can recharge it with the moon. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's, you say these words and they sound funny, except people believe it. And then you say, boy, we do have a problem with scientific literacy in, in this country. And so I decided I, well, you know, that's my cat. <laughs> put that in there, sorry. Because we don't want to become handmaidens of the patriarchy. Sorry, I threw that in there. Um, that's my one-eyed cat, Luna. Um, so, you know, because if you follow along, this whole idea about the jade egg is that women did it for, which they didn't, but um, for concubines did this to please the emperors. Because that's, you know, that's a goal, right? Like, that's a goal of modern woman. So, you know, this is messaging that would really fit in with the patriarchy. And that's my cat, Luna. She's one eye. And so, you know, a fine right eye offends the pluck it out. That's, that's her. She goes as one-eyed characters every year. She's going to go as Thor from Ragnarok this year. So, um, so, and I'm going as Gwyneth Paltrow. 
<laughs> anyway, so you think about her site, and you think that this is branded as female empowerment, but the medical information comes from a ghost, right? They have this guy, the medical medium, who talks to spirit, who's like one name like Cher, and gives the medical information from spirit to people. Um, and obviously there's also, they're partners, so they have bias, so they partner with companies. And so they do all the things that we know in medicine are wrong, because you shouldn't get your healthcare from a medium. And yet they're, you know, they're worth $250 million. And so I really wanted to know more about it, and so I decided to go to the Goop Health event. Um, and I didn't go undercover, you know, I, I said who I was, and I walked in, and um, you know, they had charcoal lemonade, which tastes really like if you wash down a spa and drank the effluent, like that's what it tastes like. And the food was terrible. I'm like, oh my, it sucks to be Gwyneth. And there she is. I was standing just six feet from her, um, and, uh, and it was really as underwhelming as I thought it would be. Um, but the thing that I found fascinating was I was in this room in the same way that I found my sort of little experiment about conspiracy theor theories and the, um, my dog and stepping in marijuana, was I'm in this room, you know, it was about as many people as there are here. And there was a medium up walking around doing readings. And we're in a room of people who can spend $600 plus to go to a conference about nothing, right? And New York, and, uh, and fly there and stay there. And you know, her, you know, the lead questions, the cold call questions that the mediums use, the first one she said, have you thought recently about buying a purse? <laughs> okay, do you like shoes? Well, because nobody in the room likes shoes, I can tell you that. I mean, it, and people were eating it up. And then, you know, they got on stage and they talked about how death wasn't real and you could bring yourself back from the dead with love by your dead brain. And I'm looking around for the panic button going, what is going on here? And everybody's laughing it up. And it really tells me that people really want to belong. And they felt that they belonged there and that they were being listened to. It didn't matter that they weren't you know, that none of their needs were being met. And it made me think a lot of our president, right? That it's all about people feeling that they are belonging. It doesn't really, none of else of it matters. They just want to feel that they're being listened to, even though they're actually not. And it's really an interesting, interesting thought experiment when you think about it. So, you know, I got attacked for doing all this kind of stuff, but that's okay. It, you know, I'm a big girl and I can take it. And I actually personally think it's really funny that, you know, that a blogger who doesn't get any paid any money for doing what she does, who writes her posts late at night, um, who has no advertising, has actually, you know, caused a $250 million company to actually have to pause. And I think it tells us that, you know, standing up for one thing matters. That if you say, this is my Maginot line, this is the line that I say, you know, I'm speaking the truth about women's health. And if you're gonna, anywhere you are, if people are gonna speak against it, I'm gonna stand up to that. And I think that, you know, that people are looking in times of misinformation for people to stand up speaking the truth. And so whether you're talking about, um, you know, 9-11 or whether you're talking about vaccines or whether you're talking about whatever is personal, that it does eventually make a difference, I think, if you stay with it. Um, but what I find really fascinating is that through all of this, that Goop has successfully rebranded modern medicine as evil, even though they have, you know, they're selling all these wellness products in their store. They're selling things that are less tested than any pharmaceutical and yet they're not evil. It's really fascinating to me that people believe that. And so I think that goop is a symptom, and I think that there's four different sort of things that happen that get people to sort of go down these sort of medical conspiracy, wellness sort of pathways. A lot, some of it is the nature is benevolent and I can control my body, and I would ex sort of align those people sort of being, you know, probably very extremely left-wing. And then there's a the distrust of government paranoia, and those are probably more the right-wing people. But there's also people we can reach. You know, you're probably never gonna change someone's mind who thinks that they can heal their own body. But somebody who has a lack of information, you can get to them with information. People who have fear and anxiety, people who are worried about, you know, in my area, neck of the woods, sort of vaginal shame, you can also probably reach them with a well-crafted message. That's not the person to yell at, that's the person to sort of give them good information and let them come to you. So I actually believe that with good information, we can actually reduce, you know, maybe about 50% the type of people who fall down these sort of, you know, bad rabbit holes. 
And you know, I think because of my persistence, Goop's had to hire people, and apparently they're looking for a research assistant. Um, that's pretty good because I don't think they know what's going on. Um, we'll see what happens. You know, there's lots of junk journals to publish in, um, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, the for me, facts are what really matter, and that's why I do it. I think that whether it's facts about the vaginal microbiome or facts about abortion or facts about contraception, uh, I like that people can see me as a, a, a valid source where they can come and they know that they're going to get curated information that actually matters. And I am... Oh, hang on. I went too fast. And I am slightly petty. This is the moment um, where Gwyneth Paltrow was asked on the BBC just last week by the interviewer about the Canadian gynecologist. I think I know where I live, but whatever. Um, so, uh, and I just thought, you know, it's, it's great that people are asking now that when you say it enough, it actually starts to get the news people involved. And, you know, hopefully we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm not giving up yet. There's more things coming out. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's not that I want somebody like Goop to fold. I would be happy if they could actually just give women good information. If somebody has the amount of privilege that Gwyneth Paltrow does, why can't she use it correctly? Why can't she use it to pass out great information? How amazing would that be? She could reach so many people and actually help so many people. So we'll see. But in the end, you know, no woman has ever benefited from misinformation about her body. And that's why I'm here and that's why I'm standing up for women. And I'm just going to end with one last Halloween slide because we're all about that in my house. Um, and uh, that was our homage to our, you know, uh, Sir Peter Gondor sort of, which now I know is shared by a billion people and I don't feel special at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to be notified about new videos. You can follow us on social media, and if you really love what we do, consider supporting us with a donation. Links to all that good stuff is in the description below.